Please. Yesterday we reported that uh, the administration is going forward with a Bloomberg era plan to build a new jail on Rikers Island that may cost up to a billion dollars. Combined with uh, what some other supporters view as street on police work, uh, on reform of the NYPD with respect to the stop and frisk bill, uh, some people are saying that they feel betrayed. They feel that they feel betrayed the progressive agenda on criminal justice reform. I appreciate the concern, but I'll say this. We, first of all, the decision about Rikers is going to be made based on several factors. We're going to look at the whole situation of corrections in uh, the 10-year capital plan, which is due in January. We're obviously going to be working with Judge Lippman on the commission that he has to see what viable options may be. I want to be careful, uh, and I look, I get why anyone in a perfect world wants to close Rikers Island. I've said I think it's a noble idea. I certainly understand why it moves people humanly. But I've also said if you think that closing it and creating a whole lot of other jails without changing the fundamental culture and the approach to corrections is going to achieve something, I think you're missing uh, the reality of what we're facing. So and I also like to remind people my gold standard is my platform. And my platform did not say we're going to close Rikers. I'm going to give it a serious look, working with George Lippman and the council speaker. I'm also going to look seriously at what we would do if we stayed and what would give us the best chance of change. We also have to think about the cost, the timeline, everything that goes into that decision. So I think it's perfectly consistent with the values of this administration. And look, I'm going to be very blunt with everyone. Look at the track record on criminal justice reform. It is nonstop. And look at the corrections reforms we put in place. They've been nonstop, and there's a lot more where that came from. And that's what I think really matters here. David. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Weather, you said this, but is there a new facility being constructed on Rikers Island now? Yes. Yeah, I don't know of any new facility being constructed on Rikers Island. I know there's work being done in the existing facilities, but let's have folks who are more expert than me speak to that. Marsha. I have two unrelated questions. First of all, at ACS, four managers have been suspended in Correct. I wonder if you think 30 days is enough in a case where you have a child to pass Oh, that's just the beginning, Marcia. The uh, suspension is the first step. I think it was made very clear by Commissioner Carrion. There are a number of other options for discipline. And uh, we're going to keep looking at this whole situation and look at any and all people who may bear responsibility here. And we're absolutely going to have consequences for them. Say again? Uh, if for an individual employee, there's an option, depending on the case, so I'm not speaking about any individual now, I'm making a broad statement about our tools, depending on who they are, what they did, if they happen to be in a union or not, uh, there's obviously demotion and reassignment. In some cases, there's termination and other types of penalties. Yes. Correct. I wonder how you feel about that. Should it go to the lowest bidder, or should you allow there to be a, a test on the street of 1,000 cameras of each company to see which one is the best? No, I, this is, look, let me, let me say, first of all, I appreciate the question and the way you're asking it, which is we, what are the different considerations, cost and, and quality, and how you make a decision like this. Uh, in the vein of being equal opportunity, I will throw a dart at the New York Times for an incredibly inaccurate uh, headline in the newspaper. Uh, VView is not a startup. They're a highly established firm that has been in this field for years. It's really easy to know that. We'll happily give you all a fact sheet on it. Uh, there are many, many police agencies in the country using VView products and around the world. So uh, the uh, criticism of VView, it's not mysterious. It's the opponent firm. It's the competitor firm juicing this criticism to help their own bottom line. And some of the quote unquote community leaders who have spoken up are also known to be people who are available for hire. So the, the fact is that VView, uh, we thought it was the best proposal in terms of getting the work done. Yes, it was also a lower bid in terms of cost. And this was exceedingly serious as a process. This is a very high priority for the uh, NYPD. 
and we're going to be moving forward. It, look, because the competitor is obviously going to try and slow us down, that will affect the timeline by a few months, but it won't affect the overall timeline. The thousand cameras will be in place next year, and then we'll proceed to take that up to 5,000 cameras from there. Yoav. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're very welcome, Yoav. Uh, I wanted to ask you, over the summer, your administration awarded um, raises to hundreds of HPD workers. And they were told last month that those raises might be rescinded because they uh, contravene city collective bargaining law. I uh, wanted to ask you, what, what went wrong there? Uh, did um, an agency outside of HPD approve the raises? And what do you intend to do to resolve the issue? Yeah, it was not handled right. Um, I think HPD had perfectly good intentions, and it had to do with a group of workers who were doing very important work. and but I think they got ahead of themselves, and they certainly did not get the appropriate approvals from OMB, and that will be uh, reset. That is not gonna go ahead as HPD planned, uh, and it just wasn't the right process, so we're gonna start over with that. If they didn't get OMB's approval, how did uh, the payroll office start issuing? Uh, I think this was a bureaucratic foul up, is the bottom line, and it's rare. Uh, I, I don't remember anything like this in many years working in government, but it was wrong. It was, I think it was a, not an ill-intentioned mistake, but it was a mistake. It shouldn't have happened. We're going to fix it. Jen. In announcing the suspension to the ACS workers, you said that the city has found serious concerns in the management, in ACS's management of the people on this case. Can you elaborate on that? Can you tell us what these concerns are? Um, I wish I could go into a lot of detail right now. I spoke with the district attorney again today, and you know we're going to continue to abide by his desire for us to not get into the details of the case, and we, we said the other confidentiality issues. But here's what we will do, and as I said in the last press conference, we'll be back with more. This was something based on what we were able to ascertain already that was an appropriate set of disciplinary actions. There will be, if we find any other additional reforms we want to announce, that does not conflict at all with the um, with the investigation. So it's a, I, I fully understand why it would be frustrating to you. It's frustrating to me that I can't fill in the blanks the way you would like. But here's the point. We can keep taking actions even while we're waiting to tell you the whole picture behind them. Please. That he didn't want you to talk to them, to interview people they need to interview. I mean, this is your case that you're, you know, you know what happened because you managed them. Like, now he's asking you not to. No, no, I, it's the same, we, nothing's changed since last week. We can't, it's the same thing we talked about at great length in the press conference. I don't know if you were there, some of your colleagues obviously were, Greg was there, et cetera. This thing, the minute you start speaking to specifics, you run afoul of either the DA's investigation or the confidentiality laws. So we just have a real simple plan here. We're gonna take every action that we need to take uh, I'm not saying trust us, I'm saying there are things that happen in government in the context of confidentiality, like security issues, where you know, we're hired to make those decisions, we're making them. We will be able to fill in the blanks as soon as we get the DA's investigation done. So we will keep taking any actions in the meantime we think are appropriate. Is Cy Vance saying don't tell the press Again, I can't go into details of the I can't go into details of the case. So the minute I start going into why we did something, it goes into the details of the case. That's all there is to it. Yes, Grace. Um, some of your emails <coughs> were part of the WikiLeaks. They were. <laughs> what did they say, Grace? They were. They were very. You should release all your emails. <laughs> <laughs> I see. No, Grace, you should say they were very well written, and you should release all your. <coughs> shared publicly like that, and uh, if, uh, and, and additionally, reading the responses internally from the Clinton campaign, which uh, made it clear that they were trying to put you off to a certain, to a certain extent. Nothing surprised me. I, look, I think uh, what WikiLeaks is doing is wrong. They're violating, you know, private discussions. I think that's wrong, but the, um, the internal conversations are classic of any campaign, and I know a lot of these people very, very well. And I, I was quite clear that I was not satisfied with what I was seeing from um, their platform, and I 
wanted to see more, and I thought it was important for them. I thought it was important for the party. I thought it was important for the country. And of course, there was going to be uh, the cause of friction. That's not surprising. I had no illusion it wasn't going to cause friction. But I think it was the right thing to do. And how do you interpret the, just sort of the, the public's access to all of these emails that have... That when you say interpret, what do you mean? I mean, is this, uh, is, is this sort of a grave violation? Has... Uh, has some line been crossed? Sure. I mean, I, you know, it's people, well, it's going to cause a huge change in culture, obviously. And um, I think all of us have private lives. All of us have things that are not <coughs> historically subject to public review and people in the political process, <coughs> excuse me, outside of government have never had the same uh, disclosure requirements as people in government. And I think it creates a very, very troubling dynamic where no, there's no privacy of any kind anymore. But here it is. You know, it's sadly probably the shape of things to come. Yeah. yeah just following up on that question, in the <coughs> emails, there were two Clinton campaign aides that had referred to you as a terrorist as we're briefly considering whether to endorse Bernie Sanders. What were your thoughts on that particular comment? Robbie Mook called me uh, this morning. I informed him I was a loyal American. And, uh, <coughs> and then we had a good talk. I've known Robbie for almost a decade, I think very, very highly of him. And it's the heat of battle. I understand the heat of battle. People are upset because um, they want what they want, and uh, we just weren't going to agree at that point. Um, but the, you know, Robbie and Jen are two people I know and like a lot. I chalk it up to heat of battle. I have no problem. They should face any consequences for that. No, of course not. Of course not. I don't know is the answer. Um, we just, just, I've had a kind of glancing conversation with Alicia Glenn about that, but uh, we have to, obviously it's something near and dear to me personally, because uh, I worked on it a lot in the years when I was in the city council. But I don't have a timeline and certainly can't tell you anything about a short list at this point. Yeah. Following up on the uh, question about uh, security. Uh, a little louder. Yeah, in, li in light of the uh, accident with you know, the DNC and the Hillary Clinton the campaign emails, uh, what steps have you taken uh, to secure the emails at City Hall and uh, your, your emails and uh, for your election? Uh, the, as I said, cybersecurity is a huge priority for the city of New York, so uh, it's a very, very extensive effort. I can't go chapter and verse into it, but we can certainly tell you what we can tell you, and we can't tell you what we can't tell you, but it is a very major effort. Uh, in terms of the campaign, I don't know if the Russians are particularly interested in my campaign, so I don't feel overly worried at this moment. Josh? In the email for you know, many months last fall, you had publicly said you weren't going to endorse a candidate until you made a decision in October. It looked like in the emails you were kind of you know, working with the Clinton campaign, telling them you were meeting with Bernie, you know, telling them you were going to tell Bernie Sanders you were going to endorse him. Why were you doing this? Um, you and I have talked about this, and I'm a little surprised that it isn't obvious. Honestly speaking, the, um, the question at hand was, was I going to endorse Secretary Clinton and when? And I had a series of conversations, and I was very clear uh, with her and very clear, or her team, and very clear with the world that I wanted to see a progressive vision. And, you know, I've been asked many times, including uh, in Philadelphia at the Politico breakfast, you know, did I have a serious intention of potentially uh, uh, endorsing Bernie Sanders? I said, no, I have tremendous respect for Bernie Sanders. I think he contributed immensely, but my hope was for Hillary Clinton to get to a place that progressives could really embrace, and I tried to use whatever I could do, as many other progressives did, by the way. Just look at some of the other folks who are progressive leaders and labor leaders and others in the country who tried to use the endorsement process to get a point across, which is part of what you should do in the endorsement process. But I also wanted to be straight with people who I know very well and have worked with for many years that, for example, when I'm, Bernie asked for a meeting, of course I assumed that would be a public matter eventually. I wanted them to know what it was and what it wasn't. And I didn't say, oh, I told Bernie I won't be able to endorse, so I'm running over to you now. I said, I still have the outstanding concerns. I'd like those concerns addressed, as would many other people. And they did, not, not because of me by any stretch, 
because there were important issues, because of what people in our party were saying, they did address those issues, and I feel very, very good about the platform and where it ended up. But you were planning to, um, you know, endure as Clinton, as you said, to where you were, and you were president for months, and, you know, you were telling the people you were happy with all sorts of things that you were going to endure Sanders. Why did you still want to have reform? Because the forum was about trying to bring the issues to the fore. Look, guys, I can attempt to explain my view of political organizing, which we've basically been talking about for two years. If you don't agree with it, that's fine. But I do think it's, no, but I'm not saying, I'm saying it's been explained over and over. I'm going to explain it again. But you got to decide in life if you want to hear someone's perspective and try and see it, or if you only want to look through your own perspective. I believe the year 2016 involved a sea change in the Democratic Party and a sea change in the country. That we had an opportunity that was developing over and over. I saw it in 2012 when I called for taxing the wealthy for pre-K. I saw it as the fight for 15 was developing. I saw it in the elections of mayors around the country. There were like dominoes falling. And it was time to keep pushing the spectrum from a progressive point of view. And many, many progressives talked about this and talked to each other about it. And the goal was to get our party to a more progressive vision, a more progressive platform. And that was, first and foremost, a belief structure, but second, a fundamental belief that if we were going to have a democratic president, that the only way to see that happen was to have a more progressive vision, because that was the only way to attract people to our candidate. So there's lots of moving parts, but the same underlying motivation. It was not politically convenient. It wasn't meant to be politically convenient. It was totally eyes open that it would not be liked. And that was not what mattered in this equation. It was for a bigger set of uh, beliefs. And I believe it worked out beautifully. I have not a regret in the world. Because a lot of different people pushed very hard for our party to move in a progressive direction, and it did. It's unquestionably the most progressive uh, platform in decades. So that's why, to me, it's pretty linear. It's just, yeah, is it messy? Sure, democracy is messy. Is it come with you know, your friends butting heads with you? Absolutely. But we're all going to still be friends. Yeah. Mayor, you said last week that you were campaigning for Hillary Clinton because who becomes president is very important in New York City. You're not getting involved in the state Senate races, but don't those have as much, if not more, impact on New York City? So why not get involved there? Well, no, uh, to be fair to you, you're, I understand why you say as much, if not more. No, I'm the, changing the federal government foundationally would mean just in dollars alone, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of education, in terms of public housing, oh, please, night and day. Much more impact. I appreciate your objectivity. Um, now, look, I think, I also think that the best way uh, to change the state dynamics is to have a huge national election victory. I really think the two go together in a very, you know, nice synergy. I am not an expert on what's happening around the state. But the little I glean is that the tremendous positive response to Hillary and the tremendous frustration with Trump will probably spill over into a lot of other elections. So that's probably going to be the decisive factor from what I can tell. But they're just, you know, from my point of view, the place I could contribute productively was in terms of the national elections, and there was ample ways to do that, and that's why it made sense to do, yeah. Um. Who, who are these community leaders for hire that you're cautioning people about in terms of the, the body camera contract? I'm sure you can figure it out. People who have spoken out against VView. And then secondly, you said um, the culture is going to change because WikiLeaks sort of revealed these emails and there's no longer such privacy. What exactly are you going to do, are you going to do differently? Are you going to make more phone calls rather than emails or text message, BlackBerry message? I'm going to whisper to people more, uh, phone calls. No, I, look, I think we've all ended up in this loquacious um, r electronic writing culture, and it's bankrupt now. You know, it's, again, I, I want to respect, I think there's a really strong American tradition around privacy and respecting privacy rights, and I think we all foolishly, every one of us in this society thought 
if you send an email that somehow that was private. It isn't anymore. That's over. So we just need to think differently. So my advice to all of us would be, you know, talk more, write less, and to the extent you write, just assume it'll be on the front page. I'll do a few extras. Go ahead. The speaker's revelation that she had been molested as a child. It's very powerful that she um, was willing to put herself out there in this way. I really respect her for it. I spoke to her this morning. I mean, it's very gutsy and honorable and painful. It's, it's not easy to talk about, I'm sure. But, you know, I, I really admire her for doing it. And I admire all the women who are coming forward now because it's, again, my theory of the case right now is that we've never seen anything like this in our entire political experience where some of the issues that are coming to the fore simultaneously, sexual assault is now being addressed in a much blunter, more forthright manner, mass incarceration, structural racism, income inequality. I mean, sadly, all of these realities that pervaded our society and weren't addressed, everything's coming out simultaneously. And again, um, credit to all those who come forward and credit to the millennial generation too who's driving a lot of this. It's a very exciting time for change. But for Melissa, I just want to say I offered her my empathy for what she went through and the pain she went through, but my appreciation that she was willing to, you know, take that and try and turn it into something positive. Go ahead. With the avalanche of coverage of all the women and other folks who have come out and said that they've been uh, assaulted, are you worried as a Clinton supporter that, that people might stay home because they think it's a shoe in for Hillary? Different question. Um, yes, of course. I think any time the polls start to move like this, there's always a group of people, you know, not a defined group, but just some subset of the electorate that starts to think, oh, this is in the bag. And that's a very dangerous assumption. And I think given how low turnout has been in so many places, you know, it doesn't take a lot to swing a state. And so, no, everyone needs to not only be worried that uh, it's not in the bag, but second, that if we're going to make changes in this country, Hillary Clinton needs a strong electoral mandate. She can't just win by a little. She needs a strong electoral mandate. Every vote counts, including in New York, where we have every reason to believe it's going to be a Democratic uh, state and, and that our electoral votes are going to Hillary Clinton, but she needs an overwhelming majority in New York to build up her numbers to help her achieve change. So my message to all voters is, I don't care if the polls say she's up by 20 points, you still got to get out there and vote. Uh, yes? Back to WikiLeaks, what kind of impact do you think those documents as a whole have on the ballot box? Have on? The whole WikiLeaks scandal, what kind of impact do you think that would have on election day? I don't think it will, really. I think it is... Sure, there's lots of things that will cause people, you know, various forms of embarrassment, but I don't think it changes the stakes of the election. I don't change it, think it changes the ideological differences, you know. I think it's going to take up a lot of time and energy for people, but I don't think it changes the fundamental course of things. I think it, that's set already. Two-part. With the Trump video coming out, do you have a message for... You mean the, the Access Hollywood? Yeah. yeah. Do you have a message for the kids at home, people, like women, young girls, who are absorbing this stuff in the cities? What do you think the school, should the schools be addressing this? Instead? Yeah, I mean... It's disgusting and it's troubling, and you know I think the message is to, no one should accept this, no one should participate in it. And look, I think the first message is to men and young men that don't be a part of such a thing and call out anyone who says anything like that. And you know we have to police our own. Um, you know these two guys were having a good old time together, and one of them should have said that's not appropriate, right? But we've got to um, draw a line, and I think. So all of us have to reject any language like that. And um, I think it's really important for women to you know, report anything like that that happens to them. And the stigma that used to attend to that, which was the worst double jeopardy in the world, uh, that stigma is coming off. Thank God. And I think um, you know, women who were ignored and maltreated for coming forward now are going to be listened to a lot more. And that's important. Go ahead. Is there a difference with that kind of leak? That kind There's of a huge difference, first of all. If you're being interviewed for a television show 
and the microphone's on and you just didn't happen to realize it was on, I'm sorry, you're in the context of a recording studio. Let's get real. But, you know, and, and equally, you know, the, the Mitt Romney tape uh, from the fundraiser, you know, from my point of view, those things came out and they were important parts of the public domain. But, no, I, I do think at the same time we have to think about the fact in our society that there still is a place for a private conversation, uh, an appropriate private conversation, not a lewd and horrible private conversation. There still are good and wholesome private conversations. You know, is something's got to be protected. Horrible emails, should we get to see them? Uh, again, I understand what you're saying. Don't miss my underlying point. Uh, we have to figure out, is there going to be any privacy left in this society? That is, that's a very different question than what we saw with Donald Trump. Go ahead. Um, Donald Trump has tried to make an association between the allegations sort of lodged against him and Bill Clinton and some of his behavior and, and also Hillary Clinton. I'm wondering what you make of that sort of equation about people saying there was impropriety, either consensual or non-consensual, there's some kind of debate. How, how do you view those two sort of accusations being put before voters? It's incredibly cynical. You know, first of all, uh, to state the obvious, Bill Clinton's not on the ballot, and we're talking about something that happened a long time ago that clearly he's paid quite a price for. Um, no, I, I, it's ridiculous. The, Donald Trump is one of two people who could be president of the United States, and he's shown an incredible pattern of abuse, and he's trying to deflect it. You know, we will never know about an alternative universe where Donald Trump might have apologized in a meaningful way and talked about what he was doing to change his unacceptable behavior. That's what, you know, the only way people would have really given him the time of day is if he had said, I did something horribly wrong and I'm doing something about it. And you've seen people in public life acknowledge their sins and what they did to change. The fact that he doubled down and really doing the most cursory apology we've ever seen that's the central issue here. Thank you, everyone.